Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today with Dr. Shane Morris. Um, you know, uh, we're going to be talking about the science behind systemic formulas. Dr. Morris, thank you so much for um, joining us this afternoon. Yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I'm, I'm excited for this. This is exciting. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, now, I do want to remind you guys before we get into the bulk of uh, Dr. Morris's presentation that this is interactive. If you guys have any questions, please write in, let us know so that we can get those addressed. And um, Dr. Morris, um, all of our viewers pretty much know who you are. So uh, why don't we just jump into this real quick, uh, get right into the meat of why we're here. Um, so if you could start with giving us a little bit of a background on you know, kind of an overview of what we're going to be seeing in your presentation today. Yeah, absolutely. Indeed, it's an exciting topic. And there is a, a mantra that I've been pretty much telling everyone at the beginning of every introduction, and that is we all have been so passionate about natural healing, um, the wellness model, the personalized model. And I know NRT is a way to address the entire body and the the underlying causes, not just symptoms, not just you know removing organs or what have you to to treat a problem. But we want to know what's going on. And it wasn't until about a decade, just over a decade ago, that I too was struggling with you know the herbal formulas, the nutritional formulas. They weren't addressing everybody equally. Some people were getting benefits, others weren't with the innovation of what we call the omics revolution and we were able to find out that we have a new and invisible organ we all now call it the microbiome and you've likely heard me use that term many many times it's a beautiful new way at looking at our body with an invisible organ i mean this organ needs to be treated differently it needs to be nourished it needs to be taken care of it needs to be um exposed to all of the things that it was designed to be exposed to and we've limited that or we've gone the other direction and we've tried to kill it so the microbiome is my newest and passionate endeavor and it's been over a decade so a lot of what you're going to hear today has been work something we've been working on the lab for over a decade and we've looked at it you know anecdotally clinically we've we've followed all of the global labs academic labs that are certainly interested in it and it it isn't just a small niche anymore this is becoming right. a massive change in the way we think about our bodies therefore i think today is a another more introductory but i want to go from explaining why the microbiome is so important to our model because if we don't embrace it in our model i can promise you that other <clears throat> not to i don't want to be derogatory but um, pharmaceuticals and other groups are trying to grab this technology and do something different with it. We need to take hold of the reins and do something with these bugs because they're part of us. They're owned by us. They need to be in us. They need to be around us. We need to share them between each other uh, and so on. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, it's, it's part of who we are and we don't want anybody to take that. We need to bring them back into our power. <clears throat> and so, yeah, I've got lots of scientists. We've got geneticists. We've got microbiologists. We've really built an amazing team. And a lot of what you're going to hear, at least briefly, about regarding the formulas and how to use them, uh, we've got a lot of people that have contributed. So it's not just me. And, and I probably should mention that it's called the My Biome brand. And so <clears throat> instead of just calling it systemic, we called it My Biome because we really want to set the, a tone we want people to know that it's innovative, it's new. You know, a lot of people, if we, if they just see a systemic formulas, they think of my grandfather's formulas. And mm -hmm. certainly it's built off the same principles. However, it is new and it involves a lot of uh, future pacing. And so we did want people to stop and go, hey, where are these guys headed? What are they doing? <clears throat> and we're, and the irony here is when you think about the microbiome, we all, that's a new term. It was, it was created not that long ago in 2001. However, going all the way back to the fourth century, there was a doctor, Gi Hong, who was using human feces as a supplement or as a medicine in traditional Chinese medicine. If you think about that, he was, he was actually curing diarrhea, 
constipation by fermenting human feces from a healthy donor. That's how far back this goes. And then if you look all the way through the, you know, middle 1900s, early, you know, 1909, 1846, you can see that these very unique and somewhat ostracized uh, scientists, healers, and so on, were also using technologies related to microorganisms. You have fermenting of, of milk, like goat's milk by Mechnikov. You have Arthur Kendall proposing that your gut is full of bacteria that help you digest your food, so all your alimentary canal is. That was a proposal in 1909. And here I am in 2022 telling you that the microbiome is trillions of bacteria on you and in you. But really, you know, Arthur Kendall kind of was 100 years ahead of the game. Uh, Ehrlich, same thing. He, you know, he looked at what was going on with pathogens versus the good bugs. And that's something we'll touch on today. Fleming, as we all know, introduced penicillin, which at the time could have been a brilliant introduction because it is a natural product. But instead of treating it as such, it ended up becoming the antibiotic revolution. And I can mm. tell you from a microbiome standpoint, that is one of the worst ideas we've had as a as a population. The antibiotics ended up becoming not only to treat something that was necessary to treat, that would have been a great idea. But we all know now that antibiotics are overused. They're in they they feed our animals, chickens, cows, you know, they're in every single thing. They're in our water now. They're everywhere. This has been extremely detrimental to the entire healthy microbiome. It, it's, it is responsible for many cases of what we call extinction events, where we've lost organisms that were once handed down from mother to baby for generation after generation. Antibiotics have destroyed some of those bugs, and now, now children being born today in industrialized nations lack these organisms, these amazing organisms that their great-grandmother had. And, and here right. we are now wondering why are we such a sickly society? Well, wow, you know, that's, we that's incredible. a lot of it ourselves. Yeah. And then I won't go through the whole list, but as you can see, this is this is a an amazing new approach to health. I hope that people embrace it as part of their existing protocoling, their existing testing, their existing um, acceptance of a patient. When you see a patient, one of the questions that I want everyone asking is, okay, we know you have symptoms. We know, you know, this is your dietary choices. These are your medicinal choices, but let's look at you as a whole and included in that whole is what is going on with your microbiome. Gotcha. In order to do that, let's talk about some of the microbiome science definitions. This is, this is where a lot of people get stuck up stuck up, get caught up in the language, the vocabulary. The vocabulary that we have, and it's all relatively new again, which is why I think people are starting to uh, not only listen, but go, okay, what does that mean? Let's, let's break it down. So I think most of us understand the term probiotic. However, by definition, a probiotic needs to be a live microorganism that when administered in adequate amounts, it confers a health benefit to the host. For the most part, we consider ourselves the human host, but you'll notice there are probiotics for your dog, probiotics for your cat, probiotics for your horse, and so on. They all exist. But I want everybody to take a moment here with all of these definitions, and every time you pick up a label of a cosmetic or a supplement or a drink mix, you know, a nutritional food, a functional food, if there isn't a live microorganism in there that confers a health benefit, it truly isn't a probiotic, it's just called a live organism product. Or in the cosmetic world, that term is being thrown around uh, so much that it's become almost abusive. It's an abuse of the word because probiotics really don't exist in cosmetics for the most part. What they're doing is they're putting the word probiotic on the label and there's nothing in there but dead material. <laughs> and, you know, they're ultimately, hopefully they'll get, you know, a little slap on the wrist, but we have to be careful with labeling and we'll get into that in a minute because probiotics 
have a very specific purpose. And as we in the lab look at our probiotics, they have to have a human benefit. We don't we don't right. use probiotics that are or grow them or study them where they have a benefit in a shellfish. And there are those that have benefits in, you know, the the food industry, whether it be for the shellfish or the fish itself and so on. These are human based probiotics. Prebiotics, a term that isn't as well known or used and recognized for the most part, I think most of us do, but a prebiotic is a microbial accessible carbohydrate. It's a type of fiber and it's metabolized not by the human, but by the microbiota. So if you don't have any good microbiota, there are many fibers that we eat that provide us zero benefit. There's a lab in uh, at Stanford that did some studies on people looking at fiber intake. And of course, in the westernized world, we know that our microbiota is sitting at a deficit. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a general rule. When you see patients from this industrial, industrialized country, let's just say America, these patients likely have what we consider a less than adequate microbiome. And that's because of where we are, what we've done, what we've been exposed to over the last few centuries, we have eroded our microbiota or what we call our normal flora. Gotcha. When you just simply add back a fiber, you know, how many times, and even I'm guilty of it over the years, oh, let's just eat more vegetables. Let's eat more high fiber diet. This group, it's the Sonnenberg lab discovered that when they did that to people who already had a dysbiotic microbiota, there was no benefit. There was no gain in diversity because the bugs were not there to digest the fiber. So how did they address that? Well, they addressed that by looking at fermented foods, probiotics. And when you combine fermented foods, probiotics into the diet and then reintroduce these fibers, now they saw benefit. So it isn't sufficient just to tell your patient to eat more fiber. That actually could work, work in, the, in the wrong direction for you. So there's just nuances that we're learning that I think are so important for us as we go through this journey. Yeah, really quickly. Quick question for you before we yeah. uh, move on. You're talking a lot about the uh, probiotics and prebiotics in, in the microbiome. And one thing our, all of our practitioners have seen and even non-practitioners have seen is an increase in uh, you know, non-optimum health conditions, you know, diabetes, so on and so forth, um, over the last 50, 60 years, and it's getting worse. How much of that would you say is directly related to this whole uh, microbiome, probiotics, prebiotics thing that you've been talking about? Yeah, it's significant. And I think one of the, one of the probably most revolutionary aspects of discovering the microbiome and its impacts, which are increasing every day, is we have been spending, as you mentioned, decades trying to figure out these chronic conditions. And these chronic conditions are a industrialized country problem. If you go down into uh, Amer Amerindians in South America or into more of the Central African peoples, they don't have these issues. They don't have allergies. They don't have diabetes. They don't have heart disease. They don't have things like Alzheimer's or autism. These are things that we have introduced into our society. And really our focus has been, okay, how do we treat them? Until the microbiome came along, we failed at that. If you think about that, We've been trying to treat these, these problems for at least two decades, aggressively, right. aggressively. You know, eat more fish, your oils, your, your drugs, your herbs, and we have not successfully changed the trajectory of these conditions. Now, science, current science of the microbiome is showing that they can be treated. There's now been allergies reversed. There's been food sensitivities reversed. IBS, Crohn's, gluten sensitivity can be res reversed through microbiome alterations. Um, cardiovascular output 
and LDLs and HDLs have been reversed by microbiota or probiotic prebiotic dietary interventions, not drugs, not this, not these are things that are intimately connected to the microbiota, which is why I'm so excited about it because even if you take an herb or take a drug, there's now significant evidence coming out of various labs showing that if you have a particular microbiota and you take a certain pharmaceutical or a certain herb, if you have the wrong microbiota, you convert that compound into something dangerous. If you have the correct microbiota, you convert that compound into something useful, which is why when you see studies like, oh, this drug is only 30% effective, that's because 70% of the people have a disrupted microbiota. And that can be a fiber, that can be a pharmaceutical, that can be a nutritional supplement. These are things that we have not considered that most of the digestion, most of the heavy lifting that goes on in converting our food or anything we put into our gut, the majority of the work done on those materials is done by the microbiota. It is not done by us. We have very little ability to convert foods. We're good at converting protein into amino acids, starch into sugars, and fat into uh, free fatty acids. Those are our main three. We we work on the macronutrients. That's what we can do. Your microbiota generates millions of enzymes that can convert plants into phen- phenomenal foods, into phenomenal medicines. They can convert fibers into phenomenal compounds like neurotransmitters, neuromodulators. Your gut actually makes dopamine, serotonin, and it's not made necessarily by your cells, it's made by the microbiota. They make hormones for us based <laughs> on your food intake. You take certain plants into your body and your gut can make hormones. Now for women with a dysbiotic gut, many of them who have estrogen dominance, that isn't because they're making too much estrogen, it's because every time they try to get rid of estrogen, their gut is converting it back into estrogen and sending it back through the colon- colonic tissue into the bloodstream so they can never get rid of estrogen so they're estrogen dominant it's a bacterial issue not a hormonal or an endocrine issue and that's now called that's got a new name it's called the estrobolome which is the estrogen microbiome in women that can be highly detrimental to many women we try over and over again to fix them with herbs but it's really the bugs that need to be fixed and this is a going to be a reoccurring theme everything i told you Laid into this next uh, slide that we have up here. So everything we're talking about has really been the impetus for us. You know, when we, I've been working on bacteria for decades, but I didn't even see the true clinical power until we had the ability to look at the microbiome. And that really came about because of the omics testing, you know, the human genome. Now we can look at bacterial genomes and so on. At that moment in 2010, is when we switched our research impetus from just therapeutic herbs, therapeutic nutrition, you know, the the tools that I had in my tool belt for the last 30 years, which I love, by the way, they're still amazing, but the bugs make them more amazing. So we we switched from traditional probiotic, which can transiently colonize, colonize the gut. By the way, those are still useful. When we think, when we talk about that, we'll get around to that again real quickly, but transient probiotics, which are things that, that were, designed out of the um, fermentation history, you know, the the hundreds of years of cheese making, yogurt making, fermented foods, kimchi, those organisms are still amazing for us, but they're transient. They come in, they offer, they provide a temporary benefit. They can provide an even more long-term benefit, but they leave us, they don't stay. Next generation probiotics are probiotics that are designed around human, to live in the human, to benefit the human. And many of those are the ones that we've discarded or lost based on our behavior over the last few centuries. So our research combines both traditional probiotic and next generation probiotic combinations. And you'll see that in our formulas. We want to address both sides because we want bacteria that stick around and do a job. There there are keystone features about these bugs that you can't get from fermented foods and there are benefits you can get from those. So that's our research impetus. Gotcha. Now, this kind of ties into the question you asked me, and that is, 
what is the true impact of the microbiome and, and how do we know whether it's healthy or not? And not to spend too much time here, but on extrinsic factors, you've got diet, probiotic use, prebiotic use, antibiotic use, and especially there's a there's a, a researcher by the name of Martin Blazer, and he has a wonderful book that he spends a lot of time going over antibiotic use in, in the world since its its inception back around World War II. And he has documented in this book how many children have been harmed by overuse when they're young because it it sets their microbiome on the wrong path when they're young and by the time they get into their 20s 30s and 40s they start exhibiting all of these chronic diseases and it really stems from destroying some of the bugs when they're young so antibiotic oh. use is a critical one illnesses there are some pathogens that we need to be very very concerned about things like e coli some parasitic infections, Shigella, Salmonella, uh, Campylobacter, there are still, we still have the bad players and we still need to address the bad players. And that's something we also wanna be mindful of. Lifestyle, critical, lifestyle is critical. Having not only a great diet, but you know, our poor lifestyle, the sedentary lifestyle, the uh, not having community, you know, getting families together and sharing our microbiome, sharing it with the outdoors, you know, getting into lakes and streams and getting exposed, you know, that you've heard the old mud story. Yes, there is a benefit in exposing yourself to all of these natural organisms that are around us. Living inside of a box is not a healthy way to go. There is something called an office microbiome and it tends to be unhealthy, just, just in case you guys spend a lot of time in the office. Get out, get into the world, you know, do some of that. And then of course, environmental exposures, there's something like 80,000 man-made chemicals that we all have the potential being exposed to the most the really the most damaging are going to be things like bpa phthalates the the different plasticizers that we you know do not use plastic end of story drink out of stainless you know filter things don't cook in in plastic cook in glass or ceramic these these compounds are extremely detrimental not only to you but to the microbiome now Got the upside of this you take all the switches on the extrinsic factors, start to improve your diet, improve your lifestyle, reduce your environmental exposure, detox essentially. And what do we get in the middle? Well, we have one of the most important aspects of a healthy microbiome is diversity. You want more diversity in the gut, more amazing organisms. Think of it as a rainforest. How interesting is a rainforest that has one animal and one plant? You know, you look around and you see one cactus and you see one mouse for thousands of miles. That is not an interesting rainforest. It's not even a rainforest. No. We want diversity in our gut. We want amazing microbiota. We want functionality, which is something that I won't be able to get into a lot, but we talked, we touched on it. Density. All of these combined, you end up going in the health direction. If you have decreased your diversity, decreased functionality, and so on, you're heading to disease. And it is specific. There are amazing publications globally i mean you can search them yourselves where we can we can take organisms from a, a diseased person put them in a mouse that doesn't have any organisms and give that mouse the disease we can give mouse cardiovascular disease just by giving them a fecal transplant we can give a mouse diabetes obesity autism depression simply by changing their microbiota nothing else so we know that they're directly related to the diseases that we are facing on a daily basis. Some of that wow, work is now being done in humans. So the connections are no longer theoretical, hypothetical. They are, they are real connections that we need to address. The intrinsic factors, I've kind of gone over those. We want to take care of our age, genetics, physiology. This is the personalized part. And right. our product line that we're going to get into, the reason I have so many diverse, different diversity offerings is because we want to be able to personalize these things to people. Some people can't start off with a heavy dose of probiotics and prebiotics. It wrecks their gut. So what do we do? We, we more gently introduce them and we switch them up instead of just strictly saying, you know what, you're going to eat. For example, here's a, a silly analogy, but I want to make my point. You're going to eat just broccoli for the next 30 days, nothing else but broccoli. That is such not a good idea. There is nothing about that idea now, but, but we tell people that, right? Because right. 
when we when they're when they've had such a wrecked microbiome, their diet has been horrible. They've they've really gone down a path for for a decade that isn't healthy. Eating just broccoli sometimes feels good for them. They're like, oh my gosh, I feel so much better, which is why these diets work initially. Whether it's don't eat anything but fat and protein, or don't you know do the paleo, there is a an initial benefit because they had such a terrible diet prior to that. So there is a benefit to that, but it's it's just a temporary benefit, and we need to build off of that. We need to build off of some of that information. So um, that's part of our research drive. Wow, that's incredible. I cannot spend a whole lot of time on this slide because I want you guys to dig into this with me later. I'm gonna have other learning lectures where we get into more of these bugs. But what I wanted just to point out is most people that have used a probiotic know that you, you're familiar with things like lactobacillus, bifidobacterium, um, cerevisiae, you know, the saccharomyces, some, some fungi and so on. These are the existing beneficial bacteria that we consider transient probiotics. What I've given you here is a list of what we call next generation organisms that we that live in healthy humans and they confer these kinds of benefits. So acromancia, that's metabolic health. Phacobacterium bacterium is cognitive health. Roseburia is immune health and so on. <clears throat> the reason I wanted to give you guys these names is these are the next generation. These are organisms that not only confer a benefit, but these are organisms that once you have them inside of your body, they stay there. They're not transient. They're designed and they have evolved with us. They live and thrive inside your body and they continually provide benefits. Now, if you destroy them, we have to add them back. And that is why we now have what we consider a next gen probiotic system. And that's kind of what I'm introducing you today. So let's get practical for a moment because everything else has been uh, very educational. I want to I want to practical some of this. So, reading a probiotic label, as I mentioned, we want to harness the benefits of both existing probiotics that have been clinically studied in humans, as well as these next generation, these organisms that live in us and will remain in us for our lifetimes. Breaking down a label, you can see the name of the label is Immunobiome, and so most of the organisms included in this label have had some clinical studies, and not just by us, but by academics or um, the people providing some of these probiotics to me, there's been some studies done on the immunological benefits. Now, I'm going to come back to this later, but I'm going to say this a number of times. Although this has some, it's specifically designed around immunological benefits, I want everyone to rotate through the different labels or the different formulas because the greater benefit is the diversity that we're creating so even if yeah. even if a patient seems to have a their immune system is coming along nicely it doesn't seem to be continually inflamed or overexcited that doesn't mean we avoid the immuno at some point in their rotation and we'll get back to that but over on the on the nutritional facts side real quick if you can jump back real quick <clears throat> okay there's names. This can be very confusing for all of us. I'm, I live in this world and it's still confusing. So in the microbiological world or in the probiotic world, there is a what we call a genus, a species, and a strain. So the very first name you see is the genus. The, the next name is the species. And then if there's a number or a letter out to the end, those are strain designations. What that means is the strain designations are particular to a given organism. That means that some research has likely been done to give that strain its numbering system. So in my world, all of the strains we have have a number because we want to keep that strain and its research together. Otherwise, you're going to be very familiar with the genus and species. For example, there's lactobacillus, acidophilus, or there's lactobacillus rhamnosus, or there's bifidobacterium lactus, bifidobacterium bifidum. These are all things you'll see on many labels, but what we have taken the extra time to do is find these genus, species, and strains that have studies behind them. 
I can go to any yo. I could go to any yogurt and pull the organisms out of that yogurt. And guess what I'm going to find? I'm going to find lactobacillus lactus, lactobacillus acidophilus, bifidobacterium bifidus. There's a whole bunch of these organisms on this planet. Some used in fermentation, some used in animals. Some I can get it out of cow's milk. I can get it out of goat's milk. But these have not been studied for clinical benefit. They still might be beneficial at some level, but they haven't been studied as such. So our organisms have studies behind them, which is why this is considered the next level of probiotic benefit. Wow, that's incredible, Dr. Shane. Now on the next slide, I've kind of preempted all that with this. So over the entire system, we have over 60 species of beneficial organisms. We want to improve diversity. We want, to, we want to make sure that we stay focused on the clinical benefits. And then, of course, we've designed the potency around what clinical studies have suggested based on the use of these in various clinical studies. And, and, as, and if you just search publications for microbiome clinical studies, you will find many. And as those, those companies are where we buy a lot of our probiotics. Gotcha. Prebiotic labels, again, this is an important aspect. Most people over the last decade have really embraced the idea of a probiotic or a fermented food. Hopefully they have. However, what we found in our research is that in order for you to maintain a healthy microbiome, you have to feed them. So you might, again, as another example or analogy, let's say you plant this beautiful garden full of herbs, full of fruits and vegetables, but you do nothing to feed that garden. How long is it gonna take before that garden withers? And now you've allowed for things like weeds to move in, uh, you've allowed pathogens like insects to move in because you're not feeding and nurturing that garden. The same thing mm -hmm. is true for your microbiome. So as we add these really amazing probiotics, and, and of course I want diet and that involved, we have to feed them. So during our research, as we were growing and studying these bugs, we found that they need very specific nutrients. And you certainly don't want, again, with the broccoli example, you can't just pick one. Oh, look, inulin is a prebiotic. Let's just feed inulin. Fantastic. It's going to feed some of the bugs in your gut, but it's going to starve other bugs because it, it's only applying to one bug. We right. need to be cognizant of the diversity of feeding our organism. If you've got a diverse garden, you don't just give it one thing. You don't just give it, you know, calcium or, you know, vitamin B12, you give it everything, complete nutrition right. profiles. So when you look at our prebiotic labels, you'll notice a broad range of ingredients in there. And it's those ranges that allow us to feed a neurological beneficial microbiome or an immunological beneficial microbiome. That's why we did it. And over the and, and again, as a system, we're going to have the neuro, skin, immuno, terra, biocrine, and then next is going to be the metabo and so on. When you look at all of these different formulas and you can rotate a patient through them over the course of months, you're now providing diversity that is unparalleled. It mimics a diverse diet to feed them. Wow. And these bugs are capable of not only metabolizing carbohydrates, they metabolize, they metabolize the colors in fruits and vegetables. They metabolize what we call flavonoids, anthocyanins, and so on. So there's this huge benefit. It's, it's almost profound at how it changes the way every herb formula you give them, the spices you're using in your food or their patients using the food. These are converted by a healthy microbiome into amazing compounds. So you'll see this amazing change in the way people are metabolizing food but we got to be careful with people that have a wrecked microbiome right what makes ours different i think i mentioned most of this we want diversity we want to facilitate it through phytonutrients <clears throat> and it's it's a lot more than just adding one ingredient or two if you compare this to other competitors they might use three different prebiotics in a prebiotic, but that's only going to drive a limited amount of growth. You need a lot more diversity to drive the growth of all of these things. Here's the lineup. I'm not going to talk about most of these on here because we've spent time talking about them. Uh, I didn't have a photo. There's a couple of things on here. Hopefully your group is familiar with some of our phage 
uh, organisms. These are in the right-hand bottom corner. These are an interesting part of the virome. We have a virome in us. We have a macrobiota. So the macrobiome, by the way, is another term for parasites. So in the really? science world, in the microbiome world, we call parasites macrobiome. We call the bacteria microbiome, and we call the fungi um, mycobiome. There are good fungi, there are dangerous fungi. There are some good macrobiome, there are some good parasites, and there are bad parasites. So in order to try to set these people up for the next level of healing, we did introduce a product called BioClear 1 and 2. And this is a product, as you can imagine, it's a, it's a for lack of a better description, we want to clear out from the GI or the skin, we want to clear out the microbiome that is not good. It's, it's in dysbiosis. It has macrobiomes and mycobiomes that are causing trouble. We want to clean them out. It also could be with people that have a very limited diet, they have overgrowth of good bugs that are killing the other good bugs. You essentially have a tomato plant that is wiping out all of the other plants in the garden. We gotta we gotta trim down the tomato plant. We gotta get rid of the weeds. We have to take care of this. So this is a what we essentially call a resetting of the microbiome. And that's found in BioClear one and two. Very cool. A blue poop pill is a therapeutic pill that that clinicians can use on their patients to have the patient take two blue poop pills during either the BioClear clearing phase or any of these other phases during the prebiotic pre and pro. What it does is it allows them to actually measure transit time. How many times have I, I've had multiple clinicians and clients say, oh, you know, I'm constipated or, uh, oh, I go to the bathroom once a day. I give them a blue poop pill and I say, I want you to record exactly when the blue poop comes out in the toilet. And I also want you to document the kind of poop it is. And there's a, there's a nice scale that you can document it off that. And guess what? People think they have their poop cycle down pat. No. Nobody has been right on all the people I've tried it on. Yes, they may wow. poop daily, but those people that are pooping daily think that they're pooping the day before food, so it's 24 hours. Multiple people have come in and said, I still haven't gone to the bathroom blue. I'm like, well, keep waiting. 48 hours later, 72 hours later, now they get a blue poop. So that tells me that their transit time is longer than they thought. Some people came back to me in nine hours and said the blue poop pill came out. I said, oh my goodness. Your transit time is way too short. You cannot absorb nutrients when what you've eaten is coming out nine hours later. You are gonna be nutrient deficient if you're not careful. So the blue poop pill just becomes a diagnostic to help us monitor how their gut is behaving while they're using these products. That's really the design of it. That's very cool. Here's a protocol. Now I know NRT is completely a wonderful way to go. I want to put this protocol on there though, because we just wanted to test this. So we've tested this on a number of clinicians with a number of patients. And what we were doing is we were trying to see how to reset the microbiome and then start to rebuild it. And I just needed some good data. And this is the protocol that gave me data where we didn't have as many GI issues. Because if you okay. just start somebody on, a, on an aggressive probiotic and prebiotic and they're not ready for that, you can have all kinds of GI gastrointestinal distress. You can have gassing, bloating, cramping. And so this was a protocol that really was born out of trying different techniques for people. So for you guys, it's just a framework to see what we've done from our product standpoint. But when you apply NRT, you can dial this in. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. We just, we just needed the framework of where to begin. And then NRT can allow you to dial this into any de nth degree you want. And But you can see we started with BioClears and we start, and then we found, uniquely we found that the TerraBiome, by the way, and I don't have time today to get into it, but it is a soil-based or an SBO formula. And the okay. prebiotic is a superfood formula. We found that this formula was the least stressful on an already broken microbiome to help start rebuilding. When we started people on the on the immune or the neuro or some of the others, it was too much. It was too much change all at once. 
the Terra seems to be much better tolerated by most people getting back into gut health. And that's really what we learned f throughout this. Wow. Uh, I, I have a question on that in a moment, but I want you to uh, go ahead and be able to finish up your presentation. Yeah, so on dosing considerations, uh, with people that don't practice NRT, we had to pretty much across the board recommend that people start with a lower dose, as low as dose as possible. So one capsule, a quarter a scoop of prebiotic, because we didn't want to trigger further inflammation with a lot of people, and especially people that already have a, a chronic issue going on or heightened sensitivities that, you know, they're on FODMAPs or they've been, you know, cycling diets through keto or paleo because they can't quite dial it in, or they have other food sensitivities to, you know, uh, oligosaccharides or other types of, you know, proteins like gluten. So we started them slow and we worked them up to a diet. And then we went over that. So there is some good data in the clinical studies that I mentioned earlier, where to get a true push, as you move them from a lower, a lower dose to a higher dose, mm -hmm. then you can test them for even going to a bigger dose because that seems to really shock the microbiome into a better place. Once they're ready and tolerant, you even go up, up the dose beyond what the, even the label says to really start shocking these organisms into taking care of the body. And they will do that. They're very adaptive. They're, there's an innate intelligence. And that's been shown over and over again. And always, you know, without it goes without saying uh, that diet is a critical part of this. And uh, I hope to do another lecture on diets themselves because not everybody behaves well on a keto or a paleo or a Mediterranean. And so we can cater these formulas to any given diet. They're very flexible. You don't have to be in keto. You don't have to be intermittent fasting. You can you can do any kind of diet and it's still beneficial in the long run. Very cool. Well, there you go. Um, I want to thank um, Michael Benson really quickly because he is the brilliant microbiologist behind a lot of the last decade and a half of work. Uh, one of these days, hopefully you'll meet him. I'll try to do a lecture where he's very shy though. So, uh, you know, I'll have to pull things out of him, but he is a brilliant man and he's done some amazing stuff. Very cool. So, um, just real quick, um, this was a lot to unpack in this webinar, so thank you. Um, I did have, actually have a question that uh, came to mind when you were talking about the terras. Um, you were talking about that it's uh, derived from soil. And is this, my, my thought process went to like, when my mom would grow her garden in the backyard, you had this just dark black, just phenomenal smelling soil that you knew there was all of these natural nutrients in it. Is that really kind of where you guys base that particular product off of is like a good healthy soil as opposed to something that's been over farmed for centuries? Absolutely. Um, so soil-based organisms are really a unique aspect of our health. And you're exactly right. When we spent, as humans on the globe, we spent more time getting our food out of a garden that was either done in your community, right? Your friend was the farmer, your friend was the rancher. Uh, you were in a community where you were always getting your food from the earth somewhere in your neighborhood, in your backyard, down the street, what have you. That's how we've spent millennia getting our food. And because of that, your body has been spending those same millennia introducing itself to these soil-based organisms. Every time you plucked a carrot, pulled off a piece of lettuce, grabbed a piece of apple out of the deal, swam in the local creek or the local lake, you were flooding your system with these soil-based organisms. So your body developed a relationship with them. And that relationship has lasted for thousands of years. Now, you go to modern day farming where that soil is completely destroyed of its microbiome. And then you take that potato or that carrot or that radish and you put it down your mouth. There's no, there's no soil based organisms, no organisms. There's more than likely that, you know, some, let's say Roundup or something on it. Uh, you know, the well, opposite effect is. <laughs> yeah. 
So we have a very intimate relationship with these soil-based organisms. They don't stay in us, they don't get into us and then remain there, but they do a ton of amazing things. They improve our immune system response. They improve, they, they have ability to digest kinds of foods. They grew up in the soil. They know how to digest things that we don't, that we can't. So they help us digest foods. They help competitive advantages. They out they help your existing organisms, your your commensal bugs, outcompete something like E. coli or mm. candida, right? They help you fight the fight because again, daily we were adding these things into our stomachs and our intestines. Every day we were eating something out of nature which contains those things. We were drinking out of wells and so on. We were doing, we were developing a relationship that we've, you know, recently we've abandoned. We've we've essentially abandoned our friends. We need to get, bring our friends back and that's where the SBOs come. So they live in you for about 60 days and then you put them back into the toilet and they go back into nature and there you go. Circle awesome. of life. <laughs> Absolutely. Dr. Morris, um, I wanna thank you for, uh, for that presentation, it was phenomenal. Um, and guys, this will be up on our webinar channel afterward. I suggest you go back and watch it a couple of times because, like I said, there was a lot to unpack in this <laughs> webinar. <laughs> I have a tendency uh, to do that. Yeah, I'm sorry. That's, that's no, yeah. it's totally okay. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm grateful that you're able to give us the information. So, um, I do want to thank you for taking time out of your very busy day to be here with us this afternoon to do this and i will definitely be setting up uh to do a follow-up with you on some of this stuff you know maybe we can break it down a little bit further in yeah, a couple other webinars uh to come so that being said i do want to invite everybody to our webinar next week it's actually going to be with dr brad and we're going to continue our um webinar series that we're doing with him on the standard intake of a new patient. And the next one is gonna be the standard report of findings visit. So uh, Dr. Shane, you're, you're even invited if you wanted to uh, come and join us for that. Fantastic. So, <laughs> all right, guys, um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We are going to uh, go ahead and let everybody run. And Dr. Shane, we'll see you uh, again soon. Fantastic. Thank you. It's a pleasure.